sorry for being a hundred million hours late for the third time. So just a handful of developments. not good. Why don't I hear anything? So just a handful of developments. The YouTube channel is uh, finally up. Uh, link in the description. I'm also making a uh, That is much louder than last time. I'm glad my headphones aren't dying. Aren't dying. I don't feel like buying new ones. Mainly because I don't want to throw away the old ones. These things have been with me forever, although I know eventually they'll fail. Anyway, uh, so I will now be posting, I know, uh, I actually just realized I never really posted the, uh, to update my original channel mentioning that every everything is transferring to the new channel there's a book lying on the table you obtained cathedral secrets a book written by Furconelli. it describes the it describes some of the archaic alchemy alchemistic symbols that are lying that line the walls of the no Notre Dame Cathedral. Books have been arranged by author. The books are written by a person named Agrippa. There is one empty space on the bookshelf. It looks like there used to be a book that went there. Okay, these are all the Agrippa stack. Contains books named by Nikolai Framel. As I was saying, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be streaming. Stands out the book that stands out the rest, Wiseman's Crafts. It's a book full of allegorical hieroglyphs accompanying with accompanying explanations written by the great Nikolai Framel. Okay. See if we have any more books just sticking out. Agrippa. Okay.
think I just boxed in Huey. find anything around here. Poor buddy. So I know how this works, but I'm missing I'm missing a book. elsewhere. something about these corpses. So this is where I supposedly was supposed to go. But there's nothing of interest here except this furnace. Disturbing. 
<laughs> looks like a human child is in there. But yeah, cer certainly that's nonsense in light of everything else that we've seen. And Fiona, Fiona shouldn't really be talking. She's the one who just uh, fed a... Uh, fed the screaming root. Some monster that was guarding uh, these catacombs. Go, Huey. You find anything here? Go, Huey. There's nothing here. What do you want? Huey. It's like there's nothing here. What do you want me to do? place I found was right here. And that's, uh, that's precisely why I don't want to go in there yet. I want to see if there's an alternative way get to where I want to go. Combination of R R R R will open the path to the small garden. So right, 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 right. It's okay, buddy. I know you tried. Good boy. The more I look, the more it seems to resemble a human child, but certainly such nonsense is the stuff of horror novels and such. Things like that don't actually ever happen, do they? So I'm not sure if this place is particularly important. I don't really see anything here, except, except this oven, which maybe might be useful. So I need to find a book by Agrippa to move this book. I 
don't see any extra books lying around. The only thing I can guess is that there must be one up there. I guess that dungeon is my only choice. Hey buddy, missed you. I suppose the only other, uh, the only other choice we have right now is visiting that, uh, that this weird place. Huey, I need you. actually Right, that's still locked. Oh, I completely forgot about this while I was running in the in the panic over there. I didn't expect that thing to just leave me alone. 
Come on. She waiting for me on the other side. I can't tell, but it seems like when I wear the metal boots, I get, um, I get detected more easily. out. Hopefully she'll go away. The problem is, is that I don't really have a choice except to, uh, I don't really have a choice except to keep trying to uh, get up there, but the issue is that it's just, it's not possible to get around her. is mm -hmm. enigmatic book written by Agrippa that discusses the secret techniques of alchemy. I mean I can't use it.
Huey is probably not that heavy. You can probably push his push him up the uh, by the butt up the ladder. See, I knew it was somewhere. Scattered mannequin parts are strewn about. When assembled correctly, these parts will all walk together to make the mannequin look very real. Screen, has someone watching films here recently? Just a lifeless mannequin. Fiona, I... The projector set up here looks rather old, but perhaps still works. Well, what do you know? We have a film reel. If this is a, uh, if this is gross, I'm going to have to shut off the, uh, shut it off. That was useful. What is this? I was being filmed. <gasps> Who's I... there? I checked. Why are you after me? What do you want? Azov. Azov. Essence of life. Of life. Of wo wo woman. Woman. I have no idea how she got there. Huey! Come on. Huey, get your ass over here.
actually isn't that dark of a spot, unfortunately. Why do you keep barking at this spot? I can't even get here. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. I want to pet you, but... Apart from the fact that she stabbed me in the face and knocked me down, that was... that was worth it. Now she's around here. Just... Come on, you can... Fiona, you could have done that to yourself. So there was a camera inside of that corpse. If you like see if you like seeing yourself because you're definitely going to be doing plenty of that. I don't want to deal with him quite yet. trying to use the uh, right analog stick to control the camera, but that's not what it's used for. It's uh, used for controlling the dog. Because that's how they, uh, that's how they keep the loading screens away, is by, uh... Okay, so I heard that there's a massively inappropriate uh, cutscene here. Is it 
device which appears to be used for measuring things. I wonder what it was used to measure. Looks like they have like plastic containers used to store chemicals. I can written make out the written word ethanol written on the labels. Look at the x rays. The label says acetic acid on it. Several bottles containing various chemicals have been left out. For some reason, this room seems to contain comparatively modern equipment. Still, though, I've never seen most of the stuff in this room. The words sulfuric acid are written on one bottle. I wonder if it could serve as a hiding spot if I'm ever in a pinch. Oh darn, it's locked. inside. It's not like anything is going to explode or anything, right? Rather dirty and unsanitary operating table. No matter how serious the illness, you couldn't get me to lay down on that table for even five seconds. Sanitary operating room. Come on. I remain undis. Watch this. I get. I remain undisturbed for like an hour, and then then and then when I finally get the key to that uh, little closet cabinet thing, um, what's her name is going to pop out. Daniela. Oh shit, she's nearby. Books spread out on the table, they seem to pertain to complex formulas. Synthesizer by Seth, writing a platinum half piece and then synthesizing with the sake of bite, a new spiritually infused substance is born. The path you are walking is ever so dangerous. However, if you don't want the sacred bite to be fouled by blood, then you should give up the grand process here. synthesizer it's been placed in this dark and spooky hallway and it looks like some weird device you'd see uh, a mad scientist use god i miss home
this is a fairly dark spot. If not, we're gonna find out pretty quick. to get to that clock. Come on. you so much. Oh, I think I've gotten gotten her out this far yet. you go you just run off in some random direction Good boy. Good boy. Come over here. Good boy. Oh, I wanna... Good boy. Yeah, he's not buying it. Come on, I wanna pet you. Good boy. You want more food? We have plenty.
I don't want to throw them away, I just want to take them off. seconds. I'm honestly about to sho just shove, shove past her. See if I can get to that clock. There's a lot of dark spots to hide. I could probably hide right here and she wouldn't be able to see me. minutes of gameplay we covered maybe a few square meters actually I need to go check out those cages say about these, uh, whatever is going on here. you to do. Seems 
seems like it's like it's an important uh, piece, so I'm going to explore some other areas first before committing to using it. You. Doing your little robot walk. this thing. She'll walk up right by me. Thank <laughs> you. 
on. It's not bothering us. Well, she seems to really calm. This stupid thing attacked me here. cage. What in the world could they have been keeping there? Of course. Good boy. Curious about that. Uh, I think that's a homunculus. I'm curious what 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 its deal is, but it's not bothering me. So I guess. She she draped over this thing. Why are they even trying to hide everything away like this? At this point, Fiona is just thinking it's 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 not it's not trying to grab me, so I'm not even I'm not going to give it a reason. She seems to see me. Floppy boots kind of reminds me of Thief. something. Follow me. I'm, I'm within your line of sight, buddy. Come on. Come on. Huey. 
so no hints here. Come on. Go, Huey. He kind of he's kind of speeding through this. Okay, one more Go time. Huey. I'm going to follow you. Go Huey. Activate this thing. There's a button located on the back of the armor. Push the button. Activation switch for it will be trapped. Well, now it's deactivated. There's the top floor of the library. to do this, but I am not in a condition to play this game uh, for very long today. Like, I know, I know I said I would try to get some rest the last time, and I did. Although I did get some things done. Uh, this is going to be a much shorter stream, obviously. Um, probably the shortest one I've made so far. gonna read maybe two sections this time since it's an extra short stream it's only one hour and I really didn't get that far although I did make good progress I didn't die let's keep it that way Knives in the moon. The moon slid inexorably into its zenith, the shadows shriveling to the feet of all that cast them. And as Rantel approached the hollow at the hem of the twisted woods, he was treading in a pool of his own midnight. The roof of the twisted woods reflected the staring circle in, in a phosphorescent network of branches that undulated to the lower slopes of Gormenghast Mountain. Rising from the ground and circumscribing this baleful canopy, the wood was walled with impenetrable shadow. Nothing of what supported the chilly haze of the topmost branches was discernible, only a winding facade of blackness. The crags of the mountains were ruthless in the moon, cold, deadly, and shining. Distance had no meaning. A tangled glittering of the forest roof rolled away, but its furthest reaches were brought suddenly nearer in the bounds by the terrifying effect of proximity in the mountain that they swarmed. The mountain was neither far away nor, nor was it close at hand. It rose starkly, enormously, along the lens of the eye. The hollow itself was a cup of light. Every blade of the grass was of consequence, and the very few scattered stones held an authority that made their solid separate marks upon the brain, each one of, with its own unduplicated shape, which rising brightly from the ink of its own spilling. When Rantel had come to the verge of the shadow of the chosen hollow, he stood still. His body, uh, his head and body were a mosaic of black and ghastly silver as he gazed into the basin of the grass below him. 
His cloak was drawn tightly about his spare body, and the rhythmic folds of the drapery held the moonlight along their upper ridges. He was sculpted, but his head moved suddenly at the sound, and lifting his eyes, he saw a bre break in the rise from, the, be, from beyond the rim across the hollow. They descended together, and when they had come to the level ground, they unfastened their cloaks, removed their heavy shoes, and stripped themselves naked. Rantel flung his clothes away to the sloping grass. Bregan folded his coarse garments and laid them across a boulder. He saw that Rantel was feeling the edge of his blade, which danced in the moonlight like a splinter of glass. They said nothing. They tested the slippery grass with their naked feet. When they turned to one another, Bregan eased his fingers around the short bo bone hilt. Neither could see the expression in the other's face, for their features were lost in the shadows of their brows, and only their tangled hair held the light. They crouched and began to move, the distance closing between them, the muscles winding across their backs. With Kaida's heart's reason, they circled, they closed, they fainted, their blades parried the thrusts of a knife by sudden, by sudden cross movements of their forearms. When the Rantel carved, it was onslaught. It was as though the wood were his enemy. He fought it with a rasp and chisel, hacking its flesh away until the shape that he held in his mind began to surrender to his violence. It was in this way that, that he fought. Body and brain were fused onto one impulse, to kill the man who crouched before him. Not even Kaida was in his mind now. His eyes embraced the slightest movement of the other's body, of his moving feet, of his leaping knife. He saw that around Bregan's left arm a line of blood was winding from a gash in the shoulder. Rantel had the longer reach, but, sw as, but swiftly as his knife shot forward to the throat or breast, Bregan's forearm would swing across behind it and would smack his arm away from its target. When at the impact, Rantel, then at the impact, Rantel would spin out of range, and then again they would circle and close in upon one another their shoulders and arms gleaming in the unearthly brilliance. As Bregan fought, he wondered where Kaida was. He wondered whether there could ever be happiness for her after himself or Rantel had been killed. Whether she would forget that she was the wife of a murderer. Whether the fight was were not to escape with, from some limpid truth. Kaida came vividly before his eyes, and yet his body worked with, with mechanical brilliance, warding off the savage blade and attacking his assailant with a series of quick thrusts, drawing blood from Rantel's side. As the figure moved f before him, he followed the muscles as they wove beneath the skin. He was not only fighting with an assailant who was awaiting for that split second in which to strike him dead, but he was stabbing at a masterpiece, a sculpture that leapt, leapt and heaved, at a marvel of inky shadow and silver light. With a great wave of nausea surged through him, and his knife felt putrid in his hand. His body went on fi fighting. The grass was blotched with the impression of their feet. They had scattered and crushed the dew, and and a dark irregular patch filled the center of the hollow, slowing, showing where their game with death had 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 led them. Even this bruised darkness of crushed grass was pale in comparison to, with the intensity of their shadows, which, moving as they moved, sliding beneath them, springing when they sprang, were never still. His, their hair was sticking to the sweat of, on their brows. The wounds in their bodies were weakening them, but neither could afford to pause. About them the stillness of the pale night was complete. The moonlight lay like rhyme along the ridges of the distant castle. The reedy marshlands far to the east lay inert, a region of gauze. Their bodies were rattled now with blood from many wounds. The merciless light gleamed on the wet, warm streams that slid ceaselessly over their tired flesh. A haze of ghostly weakness was filling their nakedness, and they were fighting like characters in a dream. Cadus trance had fallen from her in a sudden brutal moment and she had started to run towards the twisted woods. Through the dark phosphorescent night, cloakless, her hair unfastened as she climbed, she came at last to the incline that led to the tip of the hollow, to the lip of the hollow. Her pain mounted as she ran. The strange unworldly strength had died in her, 
the glory was gone, only an agony of fear was with her now. As she climbed to the ridge of the hollow, she could hear, so small a sound in the enormous light, the panting of the men, and her heart for a moment lifted, for they were alive. With a bound, she reached the brow of the slope and saw them crouching and moving in the moonlight below her. The cry in her throat was choked, and she saw the blood upon them, and she sank to her knees. Regan had seen her, and his tired arms rang with, with a sudden strength. With a flash of his left arm, he whirled Rantel's dagger hand away and springs after him as swiftly as though he were part of his foe, and he plunged his knife into the shadowy breast. As he struck, he withdrew the dagger, and as Rantel sank to the ground, Bregan flung his weapon away. He did not return to Keda. He, he stood motionless, his hands at his head. Keda could feel no grief. The corners of her mouth lifted. The time for horror was not yet. This was not real, yet. She saw Rantel raise himself upon his left arm. He groped for his dagger and felt it beside him in the dew. His life was pouring from the wound in his breast. Keda watched him as, summoning to his right arm what strength remained in his whole body, he sent a dagger running through the air with a sudden awkward movement of his arm. It found a mark in a statue's throat. Bregon's arms fell to his sides like dead weights. He tottered forward, swayed for a while, the bone hilt at his gullet, and then collapsed lifeless across the body of his destroyer. The sun goes down again. Bregon, Keda, and Rantel were the uh, were the uh, three people that lived in the uh, in the mud hovels outside of uh, the castle, basically peasants. So Keda Keda left to be a wet nurse for Titus Garone, but she ended up coming back, and these were the two men who were after her. Looks like they're both dead. The sun goes down again. Equality, said Steerpike, is the thing. It is the only true and central premise from, the construct from which constructive ideas can radiate freely and be operated without prejudice. Absolute equality of status, equality of wealth, equality of power. He tapped at a stone that lay among the wet leaves with his sword stick and sent it scurrying through the undergrowth. He had waylaid Fuchsia with a great show of surprise in the pine woods as she was returning from an evening among the trees. It was the last evening before the fateful day of the burning. There would be no time tomorrow for any dallying of this kind. His plans were laid and the details completed. The twins were rehearsed in their roles and Steerpike was reasonably satisfied that he could rely on them. This evening was, prob was reasonably satisfied that he could rely on them. This evening, after having enjoyed a long bath at the prune squalors, he had spent more time than usual dressing himself. He had plastered his sparse tau-colored hair over his bulging forehead with unusual care, viewing himself as he did from every angle in the three mirrors he had erected on the table by the window. As he left, his, as he left the house, he sprung the slim sword stick through his fingers. It circled in his hand like the spokes of a wheel. Should he or should he not pay a quick call on the twins? On the one hand, he must not excite them, for it was as though they had been primed for an examination and might suddenly forget everything they had been taught. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. On the other hand, if he made no direct reference to tomorrow's enterprise but encouraged them obliquely, it might keep them going through the night. It was essential that they should have a good night's sleep. He did not want them sitting bolt upright on the edge of their beds all night staring at each other, with their eyes and mouths wide open. He decided to pay a very short visit and then take a stroll on the woods, where he thought he might find Fuchsia, for she had made a habit of lying for hours beneath a certain pine in what he fondly imagined was a secret glade. Steerpike decided that he would see them for a few moments, and at once he moved rapidly across the quadrangle. A fitful light was breaking through the clouds, and the arches circumscribing the quadrangle cast pale shadows that weakened and intensified as the clouds stole across the sun. Steerpeck shuddered as he entered the sunless, sunless castle. When he came to the door of the aunt's apartments, he knocked and entered at once. There was a fire burning in the grate, and as he walked towards it, noticed as he did so the twin heads of Cora and Clarice twisted on their long powdered necks. 
Their eyes were staring at him over the embroidery, embroidered back of their couch, which they, which had been pulled up to the fire. They followed him with their heads, their necks unwinding as he took up a position before them with his back to the fire, his legs astride, his hands behind him. My dears, he said, fixing them in turn with his magnetic eyes. My dears, how are you? But what what need is there to ask? You both look radiant. Lady Clarice, I have seldom, seldom seen you look lovelier, and your sister refuses to let you have it all your own way. You refuse utterly, Lady Cora, don't you? You are about as bridal as I remember as I ever remember you. It is a delight to be with you again. The twins stared at him and wriggled, but no expression appeared in their faces. After a long silence during which Seerpike had been warming his hands at the blaze, Cora said, Do you mean that I'm glorious? That's not what he said, said came Clarice's flat voice. Glorious, said Steerpike, is a dictionary word. We are all imprisoned by the dictionary. We choose out of that vast paper wall the prison our convicts, the little pl the little black printed words, when in truth we need fresh sounds to utter, new enfranchised noises which would produce a new effect. Honestly, the dictionary has a lot. I, I encourage anybody who has a, who just has a dictionary lying around. Um, I'm not sure if any people are fans of print anymore. Uh, to actually just skim through the dictionary or or just set up a word of the day system with uh, with a uh, in their browser or on their desktop or something or on their mobile phone because there's there's a lot of words and i think that people barely use any of them and you shouldn't feel embarrassed for using uh for using different words in dead and shackled language my dears you are glorious but oh to give vent to a brand new sound that might convince you of what I really think of you, as you sit there in your purple splendor, side by side. But no, it is impossible. Life is too fleet for onomatopoeia. Dead words defy me. I can make no sounds, dear ladies. That is apt. You could try, say, said Clarice. We aren't busy. She smoothed the shining fabric of, fabric, fabric of her dress with her long, lifeless fingers. Impossible, replied the youth, rubbing his chin. Quite impossible. Only believe in my admiration for your beauty, that I will one day be recognized by the whole castle. Meanwhile, preserve all dignity and silent power in your twin bosoms. Yes, yes, said Cora. We'll preserve it. We'll preserve it in our bosoms, won't we, Clarice? Our silent power. Yes, all the power we've got, said Clarice. But we haven't got much. It's coming to you, said Steerbike. It's on its way. You are not of you are you are of the blood. Who else but you should wield the scepter? But alone you cannot succeed. For years you have smarted from the insults which have been forced to which you have been forced to endure. Ah, how patiently you have smarted. How patiently. Those days are gone. Who is it that can help you? He took a pace towards them and bent forward. Who is it that can restore you and who will set you on your glittering thrones? The aunts put their arms about one another so that their faces were cheek to cheek, and from this double he head they gazed up at Steerpike with a row of four equidistant eyes. There was no reason why there should not have been forty or four hundred of them. It so happened that only four had been removed from, the, from a dead and lifeless frieze whose inexhaustible and repetitive theme was forever eyes, eyes, eyes. Stand up, said Steerpike. He had raised his voice. They got to their feet awkwardly and stood before him evil. A sense of power filled Steer, filled Steer Pike with an acute enjoyment. Take a step forward, he said. They did still, still holding one another. Steer Pike watched them for a time, his shoulders hunched against the mantelpiece. You heard me speak, he said. You heard my question. Who is it that will raise you to your thrones? Thrones, said Cora in a whisper. Our thrones. Golden ones, said Clarice. That is what we want. That is what you shall have, golden thrones for Lady Cora and Lady Clarice. Who will give them to you? He stretched forward his hands, holding each of them firmly by an elbow, brought them forward in one piece within a foot of himself. He had never gone so far before, but he could see that they were clay in his hands and the familiarity was safe. 
The dreadful proximity of the identical fa identical faces caused him to draw his own head back. Who will give you the thrones, the glory, and the power? He said, who? Their mouths opened together. You, they said. It is you who will give them to us. Steerpike will give them to us. Then Clarice craned her head forward from beside her sisters, and she whispered as though she were telling Steerpike a secret for the first time. We're burning Sepulchrave's books up, she said. The whole of his silly library. We're doing it, Cora and I. Everything is ready. Yes, said Steerpike. Everything is ready. Clarice he Clarice's head regained its normal position immediately above her neck, where it balanced itself. A dead thing on the column. But Cora's came forward as though to take the place of its counterpart and to keep the machinery working. It was the same flat whisper she continued from where her sister had left off. All we do is to do what we've been told to do. Her head came forward another two inches. There isn't anything difficult. It's easy to do. We go to the big door, and then we find two little pieces of cloth sticking through, through from inside. And then we set them on fire, broke her sister in a, so loud a voice that Steerpike closed his eyes. Then with a profound emptiness, we'll do it now, said Clarice. It's easy. Now, said Steerpike? Oh no, not now. We decided it should be tomorrow, didn't we? Tomorrow evening. I want to do it now, said Clarice. Don't you, said, don't you, Cora? No, said Cora. Clarice bit solemnly at her knuckles. You're frightened, she said. Frightened of a little bit of fire? You ought to have more pride than that, Cora. I have, although I'm, a, I'm gently manured. <laughs> Mannered, you mean, said her sister. You stupid. How ignorant you are, with our blood too. I am ashamed of our likeness and always will be, so there. Steerpike brushed an elegant green vase from the mantle with his elbow, which had the effect he had anticipated. The four eyes moved full towards the fragments on the floor. The thread of their dialogue was sh as shattered as the vase. A sign, he muttered in a low, vibrant voice. A portent, a symbol. The circle is complete, an angel has spoken. The twins stared open mouthed. Do you see the broken porcelain, dear ladies, he said. Do you see it, they nodded. What else is there but the regime, broken forever, the bullydom of Gertrude, the stony heart of Sepulchrave, the ignorance, malice, and the brutality of the house of Grown as it stands, as it now stands, smashed forever. It is a sign that your hour is at hand. Give praise, my dears, that you, you shall come unto your splendor. When, said Cora, will it be soon? How about tonight, said Clarice? She raised her flat voice to, to its second floor, where there was more ventilation. What about tonight? There is a little matter to be settled first, said Steerpike. One little job to be done. Very simple. Very, very simple. But it needs clever people to do it. He struck a match. The four lenses of the four flat eyes, the four reflections of a single flame, danced and da danced, danced. Fire, they said. We know all about it. All, all, all. Oh, then, to bed, said the youth, speaking rapidly. To bed, to bed, to bed. Clarice lifted a limp hand like a slab of plenty to her breast and scratched herself abstractly. All right, she said. Good night. And as she moved towards the bedroom door, she began to unfasten her dress. I'm going too, said Cora. Good night. She also, as she retired, could be seen unclasping and unhooking herself. Before the door closed behind her, she was half unraveled of imperial purple. Steerpike filled his pocket with nuts from a china bowl and letting himself out of the room began to the descent to the quadrangle. He had no intention of broaching the subject of the burning, but the aunts had happily proved less ex excitable than he had anticipated, and his confidence in their playing their elementary rules effectively on the following evening was strengthened. As he descended the stone stairs, he filled his pipe, and on the coming, and on coming into the mild evening light, his tobacco smoldering in the bowl, he felt he felt in an amiable mood. And spinning his sword stick, he made for the pine woods, humming to himself as he went. He had found Fuchsia and had built up a kind of conversation, although she he always found it more difficult to speak to her than to anyone else. First, he inquired with a certain sincerity whether she had recovered from the shock. Her cheek was inflamed and she limped badly from the severe pain in her leg. The doctor had bandaged her up carefully and had left instructions with Nanny that she must not go out for several days, but she had slipped away when her nurse was out of the room, 
leaving a scribble on the wall to the effect that she loved her, but as the creature never looked at the wall, the message was aborted. By the time they had come to the edge of the woods, Steerpike was ta talking airily of any subject that came into his head, mainly for the purpose of building up in her mind the picture of himself as someone profoundly brilliant, but also for the enjoyment of talking for its own sake, for he was in a sp uh, sprightly mood. She limped beside the, him as they passed through the outermost trees and into the light of the sinking sun. Steerpike paused to remove a stag beetle from where it clung to the soft bark of a pine. Fusia went on slowly, wishing she were alone. There should be no rich, no poor, no strong, no weak, said Steerpike, methodically pulling the legs off the stag beetle. <laughs> one by one as he spoke. That's horrible. I, I I don't know. I'm not I'm not a su I'm not a super hippie tree hugger, but I I don't like harming I don't like harming small things that uh, can't harm me. Equality is a great is the great thing. Equality is everything. He flung the mutilated insect mutilated insect away. Do you agree, Lady Fuchsia? He said. I don't know anything about it. And I don't care, and I don't care much, said Fuchsia. But don't you think it's wrong for some people to have nothing to eat and others to have much they throw most of it away? Don't you think it's wrong for some people to work all their lives for a little money to exist on while others never do any work and live in luxury? Don't you think brave men should be recognized and rewarded and not just treated as the, sa the same as cowards? The men who climb mountains or dive under the sea or explore jungles full of fever or save people from fires. I don't know, said Fuchsia again. Things ought to be fair, I suppose, but I don't know anything about it. Yes, you do, said Steerpike. When you sing, say, things ought to be fair, it is exactly what I mean. Things ought to be fair. Why aren't they fair? Because of greed and cruelty and the lust for power. Dude, you just tore off a be poor beetle's legs. He doesn't mean anything. He just, I, I honestly have no idea what he's doing. Anyway, all that sort of thing must be stopped. Well, why don't you stop it then, said Fuchsia in a distant voice. She was watching the sun's blood, blood on the Tower of Flints, and a cloud drenched, and a cloud like a drenched slab, descending inch by inch beneath the blackening, t the blackening tower. I am going to, said Steerpike, with such an air of simple competence that Fuchsia turned her eyes toward to him. You're going to stop cruelty? she asked, and greediness, and all those things? I don't think you could. You're very clever, but, oh no, you couldn't do anything like that. Steerpike was taken aback for a moment by this reply. He had meant to, he had meant his remark to stand on its own, a limpid statement of fact, something that he imagined Fuchsia might often turn over in her mind and, and cogitate upon. It's nearly gone, said Fuchsia, at Steer, as Steerpike was wondering how to reassert himself. Nearly gone. What's nearly gone? He followed her eyes to where the circle of the sun was notched with the turrets. Oh, you mean the old uh, treacle bun, he said. Yes, it will get cold very quickly now. Treacle bun? Said Fuchsia. Is that what you call it? She stopped walking. She stopped walking. I don't think you ought to call it that. It's not respectful, she gazed. As the death throes of the weakened sky, she watched with a big perplexed eyes, and then she smiled for the first time. Do you give names for other thi to other th things like that? Sometimes, said Steerpike. I have a disrespectful nature. Do you give people names? I have done. Have you got one for me? Steerpike sucked the end of his sword stick and raised his straw-colored eyes. I don't think I have, he said. I usually think of you as Lady Fuchsia. Do you call my mother anything? Your mother? Yes. What do you call my mother? I call her the old bunch of rags, said Steerpike. Fuchsia's eyes opened wide as she stood still. As she stood still again. Go away, she said. That's not very fair, said Steerpike. After all, you asked me. What do you call my father, then? But I don't want to know. I think you're cruel, said Fuchsia breathlessly. You said you'd stop cruelty altogether. Tell me some more some more names are they all unkind and un and funny some other time said steerpike who had begun to feel chilly 
The cold won't do your in injuries any good. You shouldn't be out walking at all. Prune Squalor thinks you're in bed. He sounded very worried about you. They walked in silence, and by the time they had reached the castle, the night had descended. It's playing a dangerous game. <laughs> anyway, I think that's it for now. So, uh, the linked, uh, the linked ch YouTube channel is up. Um... to fix the time anyway the YouTube channel is up so I'll be updating uh, I'll be updating uh, the video I'll be uploading the videos there and I'll probably be transferring the videos over there and that's where the more polished content is going to stay I don't know if I um... I realized that I never linked my original videos to uh... Or my my uh, my other channel, to this to to my Twitch Twitch channel. I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing that, um, but I will be transfer I will be transferring the videos. Uh, I'm not sure if I'll delete them off my old channel. I don't really see too much of a purpose with that. Although I'm pretty sure they're both going to be showing up on YouTube. Uh, anyway, I don't really have that much news. Uh, main mainly that I'm going to keep playing Haunting Ground. I'm not quite sure how far I am into it. Um, it's a fairly long game. It's much longer than uh, much lo longer than Kuon. I think it's definitely more polished. Anyway, uh, thank you very much for uh, watching, those who did. And... Uh, I will see you on Friday, and hopefully I will be in much better shape by that point. Good night.